least it should be. Yes, yes it is. Uh, apparently I need to get closer to the mic because I'm not coming through. That's okay. I actually discovered a way to, in the editing software, improve volume levels if things were too soft. This week on the Play Ed Podcast, we continue our month of mystery with Mystery of the Abbey. Welcome to the Play Ed Podcast, where we explore cultivating connections through play. Hello and welcome to the Play Ed Podcast. I'm your host, Laura. And I'm Chris. And we're here today to explore creating connections through play. So, a little bit of business before we get started. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. A five-star review makes it easier for new listeners to find us. You can subscribe to us through the Podbean app, as well as podcatchers like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn. If you're having trouble finding us, add Laura and Chris along with the show title in the search terms, um, and please share with your friends. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at PlayEdPod, and follow our Facebook page at PlayEdPodcast. Share with your friends, share with your enemies, share with everyone and anyone. Thank you. So. Onward, we continue the month of mystery, and this one today is one of the ones... We've had this game for years. Yes. Um, uh, I was a fan of Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose, mm-hmm. and as a young teenager, I read a lot of mystery stories. I read Dorothy Sayers, Lord Peter Whimsey stories. I read a lot of Agatha Christie. I had a neighbor who... She just accumulated books. Like, she was a member of several of those Book of the Month clubs Uh that would send you the first run hardbacks and stuff. She would give me all of her cast-offs after she was done reading them because she had, she had so many, she didn't, she didn't have room in her house for them. Oh, goodness. So I got a lot of them before passing them on to the public library when I was done with them. Um, I liked the Brother Cadfile novels. I read a lot of Brother Cadfile novels. Um, so mystery fiction was a big part of growing up. And the thing about Brother Cadfile, the thing about Umberto Echo's The Name of the Rose, um, is they're set in, uh, medieval monasteries. Mm -hmm. And Mystery of the Abbey is set in a medieval monastery. Mm -hmm. And if you're familiar with the premise, the inciting incident in Umberto Echo's The Name of the Rose... The setup for the mystery you're investigating in Mystery of the Abbey will be eerily familiar. Um, And so when I found this, I don't even remember how long ago I found it. It's been at least, what, a decade more, something like that? At least. um, Mystery of the Abbey is a board game. It was designed by Bruno Faiduti. and it was originally published in French in 1998 by Multisim under the name Murder at the Abbey, although in French. Um, but I, I do not trust my French on air, so I'm not going to insult my listeners. Um, however, Days of Wonder um, published it in 2003 with new graphic design. And we have the Days of Wonder edition. So it's got to be, we acquired it not long after that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've had it a long time and played it with a number of friends and um it's it's delightful. Uh so why don't you go a little further into the history and then we can talk uh with our listeners about what is gameplay like. Well, like I mentioned, um it is published by Days of Wonder. Um and the setup is that Each player plays the role of a monk seeking to solve the murder in an abbey uh, in a setup very similar to In the Name of the Rose. There's a a monk, Brother Adelmo, who has been found lifeless at the foot of the monastery cliffs. Since the monastery is set up on a rocky outcrop, the game board is set set up as a monastery. All of the names of the different rooms that you can enter are given their Latin names, as they would have in a monastery. 
you begin each turn in the ecclesia, the chapel. There are different rooms, and each room uniquely has a different function in the game. And that's one of the things that I think is an interesting element of how the gameplay works. Like Clue, or Cluedo, depending on where you're from, you move from room to room investigating. Unlike that, each room has a different purpose in the investigations. Also, there is not a die roll that drives how many moves you can make. Players are given the option of moving up to two moves, or if they're playing in certain numbers of games, if they're uh, in a six-player game, uh, they can. Uh, there are some variants if you have up to six, uh, six players for how many moves. They can do up to three at that point. But you have a limited number of moves that you can make, but they're very much up to you. Each room has a different function. As you move room to room, you ask questions, hoping to eliminate from the 24 possible monks who are suspects. None of which are the player's characters. So yes. there's another difference between Clue and Mystery of the Abbey. The, the, the characters and their, uh, that the players represent are outsiders called in to investigate. But being bound by monastic rules, they still have to observe the same um, uh, cycle of life. So, the thing that is unique about this game is that as you move from room to room, asking questions and investigating, you have time limits every so often by the rules of the game, there's a bell that rings that calls all of the monks back to chapel to, pl to pray the next um, hour of the office. So, what happens when you enter a room? Well, you start in the ecclesia. If you enter a confessional, you can ask questions of the last player who had gone through that confessional. If you enter a cell, and there are six cells... Colored, One for each color. Colored according to the color of the player, you can uh, look at that particular player's cards. However, if the cell's owner catches you red-handed in the cell, they can send you to penance and you lose a turn. There are other op things that can help you lose a turn in the game, though, and penance and that option to lose a turn is one of the elements of the game that helps to create some game balance and tension. The scriptorium... Uh, what we would think, that's the, the place where in a... Where texts monastery, were copied. Yes. Uh, in a illuminated monastery. manuscripts were created. Manuscripts were illuminated and recopied. Uh, the scriptorium is one of the places that you can enter to gain special cards in the game. And the, some of the books are designated by a star. Those cards can be kept. Regular books have to be played um, as the turn is, um, when they are uncovered. If you enter the biblioteca, the library, um, there are other books. The player may only visit the library once during the entire game. And they have to have the fewest cards, uh, suspect cards in hand in order to be able to gain access. So the, the, the cards that you can get out of the um, library are very powerful, but you only get one shot at them. Mm-hmm. The parlor or parlatorium uh, allows you to look at some of the suspect cards that are not traded among the various players. So at the very beginning of the game, a suspect card is blindly removed from a shuffled deck and then tucked under the board. Mm -hmm. That's who the murderer is. So they've been removed from the stack of suspects. Um, you then reshuffle... And you deal out a certain number of suspect cards to each player based on how many players you have at the table. The, the balance of those are then put in a space on the board labeled for the suspect cards. And when players have their tokens visit the parlor in, during the play of the game, the, the person visiting can then take one of the suspect cards off of that stack until they run out. That way, over the course of a few turns, depending on how many players rush to the parlor to get new suspects, you can add suspects to the mix of who's known in order to help eliminate uh, the twenty-four, the 23 suspects that uh, aren't uh, guilty of the, the murder. 
correct. Uh, the crypt is a place where you can play a draw a crypto card, and the crypto card allows you to take an extra turn uh, after fulfilling your normal turn. Uh, finally, you have a couple of other areas. Um, the courtyard and aula are um, where the, the aula is the courtyard, and the claustrum is the cloister. Those are empty areas. Anytime that you end up in, an, in any area of the game board, however, where there is another player, you are free to question them. I believe you have to question them. Yes, have to. So you're allowed, you are, you are compelled if you end up sharing a, a, a room space with another player's token, you're compelled to ask a single question. The only limits on the question are that it cannot, it, it has to be a question that can be answered without revealing a suspect's name. So you can ask about characteristics, you can ask about, um, you can ask yes or no questions, you can try and un try and get an idea of how much progress has this other investigator made. For example, you can ask, have you eliminated all the Benedictines? Or all of the bearded um, religious in the community. Um, and that point brings us to the last. The well, let's let's not let that go because yeah. the person being asked the question has the option of remaining silent. Yes. The player can put their finger to their lips and refuse to answer the question. There's no penalty for refusing to answer the question. However, if they choose to answer, then they ask a question in turn, and the original questioner is bound to answer. Yes, and the other requirement is that all answers must be truthful. Yes. So, that does bring us to the last room that you can enter, the Capitulum, or Chapter Hall. And in Chapter, in an actual monastery, Chapter is where you come to address grievances, among other things. Well, it's kind of like the standing meeting of the day in a lot of businesses um, where everyone gathers. Um, announcements are made. Announcements are made. Um, certain communal prayers are done that aren't uh, done in other um, parts of the of the monastery. But most importantly for our game, it's a place where... If for the airing of grievances. And thus it allows for communal life to not end up with grievances festering and causing longer-term problems. Although clearly this monastery must have had a problem if someone wanted to kill poor Brother Adelmo. Anyways, in Chapter Hall in this game, when you enter the Capitulum, you enter there to make announcements of things you have discovered. And while the game ender is if you announce that you have found a suspect... There are other things that you can do. Well, you have suspects. You have to... The, the game enders when you make, the make an accusation. accusation. However, you can make revelations of other things beyond simply who the um, accusation of the suspect. Like, I make the revelation that the, that the murderer is a Franciscan. Because you've eliminated the Templars and the Benedictines, who are the other uh, orders floating around. And I think that brings us to the next element of deduction in the game. You have a game card. Whereas Clue has, what, six suspects? Six suspects, but you're trying to find out three different things about the murder. Suspect, weapon, weapon and location. Um, Mystery of the Abbey um, doesn't have weapon or location... But it does have 24 suspects, each of which have several um, elements. Defining uh, features. Defining features. In this, it's closer to Outfoxed, which has the the foxes and the vixens. Um, and then some are wearing, you know, white gloves or pearl necklaces or glasses or monocles or top hats or scarves and whatnot. There are different features about the suspects. And so, Laura, why don't you describe for our listeners the, 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 the elimination card, the suspect elimination cards that come with the game? The suspect record sheet has 
all 24 suspects on it with charming illustrations. I think that the illustrations Days of Wonder commissioned for this are fantastic. Top, top they notch. Really are. You have your suspects broken out into three different orders Templars, Franciscans, and Benedictines, all with distinctive colored habits. You have them broken up by their rank, novices, brothers, fathers. You have fat monks and thin monks. You have bearded and clean-shaven monks. You have monks with hoods up, their cowls. You have monks with them down. As you go through... A so le- the equivalent of, of wearing a hat or bareheaded. Correct. So as you go through... You can ask questions of different players. There are cards and turn elements that have you pass cards occasionally. There is the parlor where you can discover additional suspect cards. As you go through, each time that you've got a suspect card in your hand, that's when you can eliminate. If questions are asked aloud, there are times when you can actually ask, have you eliminated Brother Emmanuel? If if it isn't a restricted question at the time and they answer yes, everyone listening aloud can eliminate Brother Emmanuel. So you go through, like Clue, looking at cards, asking questions, and ultimately, by process of elimination, determining who is the most likely suspect. At which point you go to the chapter hall, you make your accusation. If you're correct, you win. If not, the game ends anyway, and then there are other elements that are tallied up to determine who won among the players. So that's another really crucial difference in the way the gameplay works out, that once an accusation is made, that ends the game. Period. You don't end up with uh, the way so many of our Clue games went uh, as teenagers, where you end up with everybody kind of running around as fewer and fewer people are left Mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. Correct. The rule sheet comes with some variants, some guides to scoring, um, and all in all, it's it's a delightful game to play. Um, it moves pretty quickly, and because of the bell system, as it works through the monastic hours of the office, um, the there's a hard limit. At some point, you run out of time. Uh, which helps facilitate strategic play. And actually, the progression of the hours uh, is interesting because as the hours progress, the number of cards that you must pass to other players at the start of a new hour increases. That's true. So that's another feature we didn't actually get to when we were describing gameplay earlier. Um, Basically, after either three or four moves, depending on the number of um, players involved in the game, Um, The bell is rung, everybody goes back to the Ecclesia. That's just a hard reset. You don't move the tokens by counting spaces. You just put everybody back in the chapel space. Um, At that point, the, the card for what hour it is has instructions on it for how many cards to pass to the player on your left. And so you pass a certain number of suspect cards um, or... If you don't have that many, you pass as many as you have um, to the player on your left, and then everybody gets to start moving again. Mm -hmm. And it's a card-driven game. The other aspect of this game is that because of those different cards that you can get from the Bibliotheca and Scriptorium, there are events that cause other cards to be revealed or passed in addition. Where to next? I think the next thing to look at is... What does the game develop in terms of skills? Why would you pick this game to hunt down and play? Which, uh, that's actually worth noting in game history, is I believe the game is out of print. It is out of print. Now, if you find a copy of the game and you find that most of the suspect sheets are gone, uh, the good news is that the Days of Wonder site does have PDFs of both rule sheets, if that's disappeared or been damaged, and a PDF of the suspect record sheet, so you could print up new ones. Our box has a bunch of clean sheets. My plan is to laminate six copies, and then you can play with the laminated sheets and a wet erase marker pretty much indefinitely with just six of them. And if you're going to print a PDF, a good clean color copy laminated probably ends up being a better uh, course than just printing up lots of extras. 
overall. Um, it is out of print, which means that hunting it down, it can be a collector's item, but if you can find a copy, um, definitely worth it. So let's assume that our... So why would our why would our listeners want to hunt down a copy if our scintillating description of the gameplay over the last ten or fifteen minutes has not uh, just filled them with apostolic zeal to hunt this game down and put it on their table? Well, I'm mentioning apostolic zeal, I think if you're studying the Middle Ages, this game is a really nice way to dive into monastic life because there are several elements of how an abbey actually runs that get covered both in the names of the different areas and what is their purpose within the life of a monastery. Um, And so I would think that, I remember when I was, I think in fifth grade, we had to read, oh, which one is it? Was Uh, it Door in the Wall? Door in the Wall, uh, which was about a child in a monastery. And I was fascinated. And I, like, at that point, I wanted to know everything about the Middle Ages and monasteries and how they ran and how they were set up. And I think this game has got a similar possibility. Um, if you have a child who happens to like the Brother Cadfile mysteries, uh, whether they've seen the um, old, uh, was that Derek Jacobi? Derek Jacobi as Brother Cadfile in the... Um... Uh, I don't remember if those were BBC productions or not. I, I think remember they watching were. them on PBS, which means it might. So they probably were released um, on Masterpiece Theater or something like they, that. They, they showed on Mystery. Mystery, it, mis- yes. But but like Mystery was yeah. Anyway, th- that's how I discovered a lot of those. Mm-hmm. Um, that that and the my my one of my grandmothers and one of my neighbors who had tons and tons of books that they just yeah. Anyway, so. Definitely, if you're doing the Middle Ages and monasteries, this becomes a game that is fantastic to play for uh, diving into that and wanting to know a little bit more about how are these things set up? What are these rooms for? And yet, by that token, it's not, I mean, strictly accurate. Benedictines are monastics. Franciscans are not. Templars are just weird (laughs) um, because they were actually a militant order. Um, True enough. And and, and and normally a monastery doesn't have more than one order living in them at the time. Generally, no. Uh, I mean, my, my I I just take the amusing conceit that we're a bunch of Dominicans going in to investigate all of this nonsensical um, uh, uh, behavior uh, among these among these. Well, it would make it easy. Brethren. The white habits would just stand out from the other characters. Well, that's true. Um, but the the the. The nice thing is that uh, from 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 the perspective of kind of historically grounding the 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 monastery playboard is abstracted from the re- what what a real monastery's layout would be in order to facilitate gameplay. Um, but the names are accurate to how um, the more traditional uh, Benedictine monasteries still name. The various areas of their um, of their uh, abbeys, um, the hours, and the hour, and 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 then the, the hours of the divine office. Um, that's that's something that most Americans are not familiar with. Even most most um, uh, Catholics and Orthodox, unless they have friends in monastic life or are you know like me, really peculiar, don't really generally know a whole lot. Of, but Monastic life is still governed by um, what are called the hours, and the hours of the office are um, a series of periods where you're required to pray, uh, and in certain prayers, typically from the Psalms. Um, I, I think that the the quote seven times I ro- I rose to pray uh, daily at night. I also uh, rose to pray, and the hours are structured. Around, around that, that. Um, but it follows the the way hours were tracked in the ancient world, um, and so there's an office of of prem or prime, and that would be the first hour after sunrise. You have terce, the third hour after sunrise. You have sext, which is midday, as we would think of it, the the sixth hour after sunrise. You have known the ninth hour. Um, which is roughly equivalent to 3 p.m. by the way we track time. Um, you would have Vespers, which is supposed to be at sundown, um, and then you have Compline, and then in the middle of the night you have the morning office, Matins, and then there's an office of Lauds up in there also. Um, 
and and different monasteries, real world monasteries, follow some modifications to the rule. They don't all follow the same orarium. Um, but having that as the guide does help with both facilitating the gameplay by setting a time limit and keeping things moving. You can't just dawdle. Mm -hmm. When you're moving your piece about the board, you need to move with purpose. Yes. Um, but it also invites an opportunity, particularly if you're studying something like medieval monasticism, um, or, or even how monasticism survives and thrives in the, in the, the contemporary world, uh, to, to go into that question of what is the orarium, what are the hours, why do they exist, what, what goes on during them? Yes. The other area comes back to what we've been talking about all month, which is deductive reasoning. And as we mentioned, it's a little like Clue meets Outfoxed. Like Clue, you're moving around the board, you're asking questions, uh, you're using a, a card sheet for process of elimination. Like Outfoxed, rather than having multiple um, things that you're trying to find out, you're fi trying to find out multiple features about one suspect and using that to make eliminations. And at the end of the game, even if no one discovers the murderer, if you have accurately revealed some feature about them, like I reveal that the murderer is a thin man, and at the end that turns out to be true, that's a point in your favor as you tally up game points. So you've got a slightly more sophisticated point system for determining who won at the end. And actually, in that mind, it reminds me a little bit of Harry Potter's Quidditch in that catching the golden snitch ends the game but doesn't necessarily mean the team that caught it won because there's a point system on top of a game-ending event. That will be news to our listeners who have only seen the movies. Probably so. Um, but it's an element where just because you have, end you have the I action that ends the game doesn't mean that you have the points to win the game. Right. They are two discrete elements. So, thus far we've got some possible content knowledge around medieval life and particularly monastic life. Um, we've got uh, the possible sidebar of the various religious orders and what does that mean in the history of, of religious life in, in Western Christendom. We've got um, deductive reasoning, which, which, you know, that's kind of our theme this month. And then there's also the strategic play uh, aspect of do you use your moves to try and get to the parlor and grab a suspect? Or do you go rummage someone's belongings in their cell and hope you don't get caught? Um, do you go make a revelation in chapter? Do you go to um, the, the scriptorium? Uh, and try and get a scriptorium card? Do you try and lose your suspect cards so that you can get into the library and get one of those very, very powerful cards? Do you go into the crypt to get an extra turn card? Um, do you do you pass through the confessional in order to get some information because it's really close to where the ecclesia is, but then when everything resets, somebody else can go in and get that information from you? Um how do you structure your questions to your fellow players in order to either elicit the information you're seeking or mask, without lying, what information you have revealed? And on top of that, you've got three aspects, four aspects for each suspect and 24 suspects. Five. Five. Oh, that's right. There's five. There's five. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that can be gained from this game. And one of the reasons I've always loved it as a game to play is that it's like a, I think it's replayability is a little better than Clue from my standpoint because of those variations and the variety in what can happen because of the event cards. It doesn't become as monotonous as quickly. Yes. I suspect if you played Mystery of the Abbey with five or six players and probably the same people, and you played it day in and day out for several weeks, at that point you'd probably hit the point where, you know, maybe we should try a different game for variety. But for replayability, it's got a couple of things in its favor. So... 
how do you keep it in the fun zone and keep it from becoming monotonous? First thing I would say is the recommended age for the game on the game box is eight and above, and I think that is accurate. It may even be a little on the young side. I would say it's a little on the young side. Um, our, you know, eight, nine-year-olds were struggling, um, particularly with how to f- structure the questions um, and how to process all of the different elements of the suspects. They got that they were the different elements of the suspects like an outfoxed, mm-hmm. but... There were so many elements to keep track of, even with the help of the record card. Uh, our, 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 you know, seven, eight, nine year old range kids were, were struggling with that. So I would even say it's probably more appropriate to maybe 10 or even 12 and up. I think 10 and up. Our 11 year old was pretty solid on where he okay. was going with that. Um, now, our 13-year-old who's on the spectrum was having some challenges, but it was more with the keeping secrecy elements of the game. Well, yeah, and that's that's the other thing. But we can... Uh, I, I do think if you're playing with younger kids, particularly, particularly in that 8 to 10 range, um, our solution ended up being we just play an open-faced cooperative game and use a single record sheet. Um, that everybody's tracking. And, and we've actually done that with a few of the deductive reasoning games we've played that are definitely aimed at an older audience. Mm-hmm. And it's the thing is, like, you wouldn't play it like that forever, but for understanding how to do it, playing open-faced initially becomes a way to say, let's first learn the mechanics of the game before we try to play it competitively. Right. And I think that in terms of playing open-faced and using that, the game mechanics are probably going to be the hardest part for those if they're reasonably literate and thus can read and understand the cards. Playing open-faced so that they start understanding how they're played strategically allows you probably within five to six times playing be at the point where then you could move to playing um, closed hands. Yeah, I, I could I could see that. Um, I, I'm, I'm firmly of the opinion that playing open faced to begin with is the best way to go with most games. Um, particularly because that gives older, more experienced players the opportunity to point out strategic decisions that need to be made. Um, if you don't understand what the cards are, you don't understand what they do, and this goes for any game, whether it's card driven or token driven or what have you. If you don't understand what your options are and you don't understand how the pieces fit together, you're not going to have a good time. Mm-hmm. And that's that the- pulls it right out of the fun zone. And I think the biggest frustration point, once you're at the point where the deductive reasoning is a possibility, for which 8 to 10 is about right, um, the, the hard part is strategically understanding those cards and finding a way to say, you know what? Until everyone understands the moves, the mechanics, how to play, we're going to play open face so we can give each other hints on what to do. And then once you're comfortable and understand it, then we'll move to where you can play more more secretively and keep the cards close to the chest. Yeah. Um, there are also event cards that help propel things forward. So at one point um, another in, in the game, the most recent game we played with the kids, uh, another member of the monastery was murdered. So um, there's a mechanic explained on the card with that event that, you know, one player under certain circumstances chooses one card from another player's hand, and then that goes face down on the board. Um, and as everybody walks by, they can turn it over and see who it is. Mm-hmm. Um, or it goes face up on the board, something yeah. like that. But it, 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 there are other aspects of the game play where what is hidden becomes public knowledge and there's a balance to be struck between sharing information and concealing information without lying. Yeah. Um, that, you know, I don't know, I find that a particularly useful skill in my day-to-day life, uh, but just in general and it and it makes for a fun game but only after everybody knows what they're trying to do exactly um and so yeah i i I would i would 
play it with kids who are slightly older than the recommended eight and above. I would probably focus on 10 and above. Um, the estimated game play is 60 to 90 minutes. Once everybody knows what they're doing. That's and if you play, right. And if you play with a minimum of um, around the table chatter, off topic conversation, like it's a focused game. Focused games, 60 to 90 minutes are, are right. So this is not a fast, casual game. This is definitely a you've got an afternoon to play game. Um, especially if you're going to take your time with it and you have younger players you're trying to help along. Um, you know, a group of four to five adults, six adults probably could play it if they all if are familiar with it. If you do like a regular game night, this is something that could be easily done within about an hour or so with adults. Um, with younger players, you need a little bit more time because and patience. with uh, time and patience, just to make sure that you understand the mechanics. And if you're going to go in, um, read through the booklet is pretty clear on how it all works. And if you know going in, what's the purpose of each room? How does gameplay work with regard to the turns? Those are the key elements. Well, and that's where having a PDF copy available through the Days of Wonder site is great because then anybody who's not familiar with the game, they don't have to have their own copy. They can go check out the rules on the Days of Wonder site, be familiar with them before you all sit down to play. Yeah. Um, but as far as keeping it in the fun zone and avoiding common pitfalls, uh, I think being aware, especially with your younger players, where are they? And where is their point of frustration with deductive reasoning games in general? Um, and trying to be aware of that. So possible solutions, play open-faced. Um, I, I don't know that giving extra moves is particularly helpful. Not in this one. Um, the, the game board's small enough that with the time limit you have, you have enough moves to get anywhere on the board um, during the time that you have available. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that would probably cover the, the major things. Be aware of where your kids are. Help them with the questioning, because the questioning and all of the options available and learning that the range of what you can gain from that, if you're doing that initial open phase, even more than helping them understand the cards is help them understand the kinds of questions they can ask and what they can gain from them. And that's going to be the biggest learning area that if you can sort of handhold initially. I work with adults that can't ask good questions. And actually it's It's immensely frustrating. And it struck me that in terms of skill development, that actually ends up being a really good one. That learning to ask the right question to get the information you need is one of those critical skills that we don't usually have a way of developing. And, you know, we've often talked about, you know, how people have good Google Foo or bad Google Foo. Well, the ability to use a search engine like Google or to find something in a card catalog comes down to knowing how to use the right search term. And this game goes beyond simply going into a room and asking a very simple question. There's more complex questions you can ask that can help you get at the information you want. And learning to ask the right question is a huge skill thing, but that's one that parents are going to have to be more aware of with their younger players and help develop before they can productively play the game on their own without training wheels. Well, and the parents themselves may need help developing that skill set. Like I said, I work with plenty of adults that can't formulate a good question. Um, and one of my biggest frustrations in my job is when I don't understand enough to articulate a question clearly in order to pull out the information that the people I'm talking with have, but don't realize I need. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually a big part of, of my job is, is trying to ask the right questions of the right people. And if I don't have the right people, I need to find out, figure out how to ask the right questions to get to the right people, which is, the heart of the gameplay of Mystery of the Abbey and part of why it's so perennially enjoyable. Over and above the suspects, over and above the illustrations, over and above the very, very charming monastic regula that, that, that dictates some of the aspects of gameplay, there's the fact that you, whenever you run into another monk, another playing piece on the board, you have to ask a question. And you have to ask that question in order to get certain information or obscure certain information, but you can't lie and you can't ask for an, an 
you can't ask a question that requires giving a name in response. Yeah. And that's, that's... But you've got these five aspects of the suspects that you're trying to suss out, eliminate, um, hone in on. You've got 24 possible suspects, except, you know, the ones you've already marked off. But at that point, you're talking about, is it is it exponential difficulty yeah. at that point? Yeah. As far as the possible solution combinations? Mm-hmm. So with that, I think that probably brings us to a, a pretty yeah. Good there's a lot here, and it's and it's a it's a it's well worth hunting down and getting a copy. Um, as I said, we've had it for for a long time now and really enjoyed it. And I think in terms of variations on deductive reasoning games, I've this is one of the ones I've liked for that that variety and replayability and what it takes in sort of a step up in development from other similar games. So with that, I'm going to say we I think we've covered that for today. I did want to introduce a new segment. Um, we have asked some questions of some of our children about games, and you all can uh, get to hear a little bit about what they think of gameplay. What do you like about playing games? Um, that, um, why I like games is that there's turns, and whenever it's your turn, you you get to roll a die or do something, and you get to put down what you want to do. If it's a card game, that's all. Do you have fun? Yes. So games are fun? Yes. Do you like playing games with me and Mom? Yeah. What do you not like about playing games with me and Mom? Mm, that whenever are you wet and I get angry. Ah, okay. What can we do about that? I'm not sure. All right. Thank you. All right. Well... We hope you have enjoyed today's discussion. All of the games and books that we have mentioned today can be found in the show notes. But now it's time for you to talk to us. You can write to us at playedpod at gmail.com or find us on Instagram and Twitter at playedpod. You can also follow our Facebook page at playedpodcast. Tell us your thoughts and until next time, thanks for listening. Take care. say so entirely too much. I do. That intro needs help. Yes, it does. You need scripts. I do need scripts. It's okay, I've got a script for the end.